We're thinking about the theme of this year's celebration, commemoration, remembering the persecuted church. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Revelation 6, verses 9 to 11. Find that in your Bibles, if you would. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have the text on the screen for you. We just read Revelation 5 together. We sang Revelation 5 together. And this is a scene I want you to think about as you think about the persecuted church today. Chapter 6 of Revelation. Follow along as I read. Beginning in verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. What have I just read together? Inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Oh, God, help us to remember the persecuted church. Pray for them as if in prison with them. And as much as that and more, remember the sacrifice they make. And again, ask ourselves the question, is that what my life looks like as part of the church in the West? Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we're just going to, for a few minutes, think about this today. There's some 197 church, uh, countries around the world. And in 144 of them, Christians are persecuted. There's widespread evidence showing that today, Christians constitute by far the most widely persecuted religion. Christians have been harassed in more countries than any other religious group and have suffered harassment in many of the heavenly Muslims countries of the Middle East and North Africa. There are some 245 million Christians living in the top 50 countries for persecution, and they suffer high levels or worse. That's one in nine Christians on the planet. Now, it's not happening to us here, so the one in nine gets a lot tighter, doesn't it? It's really less than one in nine. We're not facing persecution here. In fact, if anything, we're, we're facing a lethargy in the West. We're facing a yawning at what it means to be a follower of Christ in the West, which makes me convinced that persecution is coming to this country. God is coming. He's sending His Son back for a bride who is adorned for His coming, who is ready for Him. And the church is not ready for the return of Jesus Christ, not the church in the West. And so it's coming, brothers and sisters. There's Turkish journalist Uzay Bulut a senior fellow at the Gatestone Institute noted this, persecution against Christians, Christians and other non-Muslims is not about the ethnicity, race, or skin color of either the perpetrators or the victims. It is about the religion, the Christian religion. In Africa, various Islamist groups and individuals are attacking and attempting to annihilate Christians for being Christian. If these crimes are not stopped, it's highly likely that the fate of the African continent, at least that in the north, will be like that of the Middle East. Once it was a majority Christian region. Now Christians are a tiny, dying, defenseless minority. The independent review that this material comes from we studied this, and it reminds us that Weakness and vulnerability are at the heart of the Christian faith. Jesus Christ was born into poverty and laid in a feeding trough. He died as a victim of persecution Himself. Given that, 
it is hardly surprising that many of his followers today count among the weakest and most vulnerable people on the planet. It is to them and their needs and to their support that we focus our attention on this International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. As he looked at the fact that Christians being the most targeted, he said the evidence suggests that acts of violence and other intimidation against Christians are becoming more widespread. We told you that in the 20th century, in that 100 years, that more people were martyred for the name of Christ than the previous 19 centuries combined. In some regions, the level and nature of persecution is arguably coming close to meeting the international definition of genocide. The eradication of Christians and other minorities on pain of sword or other violent means was revealed to be the specific and stated objective of extremist groups in Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Northeast Nigeria, and the Philippines. You know what all those have in common? Islam. An intent to erase all evidence of the Christian presence was made plain by the removal of crosses, the destruction of church buildings, and church symbols. The killing and abduction of clergy represented a direct attack on the church's structure and leadership. Where these and other incidents meet the tests of genocide, governments will be required to bring perpetrators to justice, aid the victims, and take preventative measures for the future. Christianity, in fact, now faces the possibility of being wiped out in parts of the Middle East where its roots go back further than any other place on the planet. In Palestine, Christian numbers are below 1.5%. In Syria, the Christian population has declined from 1.7 million in 2011 to below 450,000 today. In Iraq, Christian numbers have slumped from 1.5 million before 2003 to below 120,000 today. If you know your geopolitics, you will connect with that, that it's America's intrusion into those countries, removing their leaders, that through the floodgates open to Islamist extremists to begin slaughtering our brothers and sisters in Christ. In some parts of the world, extrajudicial killings and the enforced and involuntary disappearance of Christians are also widespread. Then he cited some incidents. The destruction of a Christian school by Muslims in Uganda. A church in Niger burned by Muslims. Terror attacks in Burkina Faso that left 29 Christians dead. In one incident, the assailants asked the Christians to convert to Islam, but the pastor and the others refused. They ordered them to gather under a tree and took their Bibles and their mobile phones. Then they called them one after another behind the church buildings where they shot them dead. Terrorist groups are not the only sources of persecution in Africa. As many Muslim governments and individuals also target Christians. And as we saw, communist, communism does the same. It's interesting, though. There's no doubt when you, if you've been with us studying all year long, or we've looked at number 50 all the way up to number one, that persecute, the persecuted church around the world endures persecution because they're convinced that Jesus is worthy of their suffering. Contrast that with the church in the West, where persecution is almost non existent, and multitudes of professing Christians show their lukewarm attitudes that Jesus is not even worthy of their commitment to attend the services of the church where they are members, the church for whom He laid down His life. I want to say a few, just real quickly, a few things in this passage in Revelation 6. First of all, the Christian martyrs are under the altar. If you think about heaven, there's a couple of visible objects there. The throne and the altar. John says that when, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the Word of God and for the witness they had borne. This past year we 
heard about just a few moments ago, a Chinese pastor who was sharing the gospel with North Koreans who was assassinated by an assassination squad designed to kill Christian leaders to stop Christian influence. He is there. Those who've been slain for the Word of God. Folks, you can't get any closer to God in heaven than at the throne under the altar. What's the point of that? That dying for Jesus. Notice this, this is not Islam. This is not Mormonism. People are not offered and promised celestial sex for all of eternity if, they, if they're faithful to their calling. No. They're welcome to the closest proximity to the throne of God and to the throne of the Lamb because they were willing to pay the ultimate price. I, as I was studying this this week, I kept asking myself, Ask, what are you, what are you willing to pay? I ask you this today, what are you willing to pay? Is inconvenience to your schedule too much to ask for? Is that unreasonable for the lamb who hung upon the tree and died for you and me? Is that for us to say, well, you know, that's a little too much. Is it unreasonable to attend Bible study on a Sunday morning and then, and then walk away and go home and not even join corporate worship? Is it unreasonable to suggest, I'll just pass Bible study, we'll just come on to worship? Is it unreasonable to say, come back and close the Lord's Day out with us here tonight? Is that too much to ask for the Lamb? Is He worthy? Is He worth it to gather back at the midweek and actually pray together for the persecuted church? Is He asking too much? That's what I'm asking. And you know good and well the answer because in the face of what we hear about every week, every Wednesday night, every Sunday, about our brothers and sisters in Christ who really put their lives on the line, who put their, their money where their mouth is, so to speak, that He is not only worthy, He is worth it. Can you imagine the scene in heaven? The angels stand on tiptoe and they look down upon the earth at the church whom Jesus redeemed, purchased with His blood. And they see blood being spilt all over the planet for the Lamb whom they worship day and night. And they see the church in the West yawning, distracted, bored. You see, the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church ought to be something we rally to and commit again anew and afresh to pray for the Persecuted Church. But we ought to pray, dear God, have mercy on us. Forgive us for our thinking that tepid Christianity is real Christianity in the face of what it costs people everywhere else to follow Christ. Second thing I want you to see is the, the Christian martyrs are anxious for judgment. How long, O oh Lord, before You judge and avenge our blood? They call Him the Sovereign Lord, holy and true. You're, you're in charge. You're sovereign. You're over this. You're the Lord. Oh God, when will judgment happen? It's interesting. Talk to Christians in the West. What's one thing that some Christians in the West fear? Judgment. They fear dying. Those who are around the throne, under the altar, cry out, Oh God, judge and avenge our blood. Show the earth that you cannot slaughter the people of God without consequence. But there's a price to be paid. Show them that the One who spared not His own Son but gave Him up for all will one day surely avenge the death of His people. And it's coming, folks. It's coming. Just as surely as persecution will come to this land at some point, don't count on Jesus returning and snatching you out of here. That's a wicked teaching. It's a wicked teaching. He hadn't snatched our brothers and sisters in Nigeria out. He hadn't snatched any of those who died this past year. He didn't come for them before they were slaughtered. No, no, no. Get ready, brothers and sisters. We're going through persecution. Sure as we're breathing this air today. How long, O Lord? Show the world. And He will, by the way. Jesus will come. The One who was covered in blood, unrecognizable, will come with his, the hem of His garment dipped in blood. And He will avenge this term of the inhabitants, those who dwell on the earth. That's the down dwellers. We've talked to you about that before. We're side dwellers. We live alongside them. We may live next door to them, but we're not supposed to be like them. We're not supposed to value the things they value. We're not supposed to ignore the things of God the way they do. 
You can drive out of a neighborhood and anybody can stay at home on Sunday morning. If they're down dwellers, they don't care. Anybody can stay at home Sunday night. It's the side dwellers who say, no, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. My brothers and sisters in Christ are gathering. I'm going to spend eternity with them. I'm glad to go gather with them. How long? Here's the answer. Christian martyrs are honored in heaven. They were each given a white robe and told to rest. The white robe, the robe of purification. The robe that, that not only that they're justified by faith, but that their sanctification, their growing in grace, made them more and more like Jesus while on the earth. And so they're clothed in a white robe to look like Him. What's He coming back in? A white robe. And they're given this robe to wear, and then they're told, rest a little longer. Wait a little longer. And then finally, they're numbered by God. Notice this. You know, we, we talk about election here, that the number of elect, there's a definite number of the human grace that God had set His heart upon in eternity past to save and bring to glory. There's also a definite number of the martyrs. Have you ever wondered why, why has the Lord not come back yet? This is the answer right here. Revelation 6. Until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Time is running down and it's being marked by the slaughter of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And I tell you this with every confidence in the Scripture that is inerrant, infallible, and all-sufficient, that when the last martyr's life has been taken, the trumpet will sound, the heavens will part, the dead will rise to join the army of the Lamb which spills out of heaven where He will gather up all of those, not only those who hated Him, not only those who lived ignoring Him. Matthew 7 at the end tells us those who called Him Lord, Lord, but did not live as if He was their Lord. And He will throw them all into something that the best image we can have in Revelation is a large wine vat and He will trample the enemies of God under His feet until He has absolutely and totally destroyed them. And they will be tossed, atheist and religionist, into hell for all of eternity. And the angels and the inhabitants of heaven will cry hallelujah when it happens. Because God, the sovereign God, the Lord, holy and true, will have been vindicated. At long last, He will have demonstrated infallibly that you are loved by Him if you follow His Son and that He will avenge any wrong done to you. So where are you today? Are you on the side that will be avenged? Does your life reflect that? Do you live on your calendar daily? Jesus is worthy. My calendar shows it. Do you take the Lord's day? And is the Lord's day the day of the Lord? His day, a day you live in anticipation of the final day of the Lord? Is He uppermost in that calendar, that first day of the week that He set aside for us to gather as the people of God? Where are you? This is the day we remember the persecuted church around the world. But as best I can read, everything I read about the persecuted church they are, while they live, the most faithful Christians on the planet. They walk for miles, starting many times before daylight, so they can be with brothers and sisters when they gather to worship. They go in great danger. They, they sneak out and sneak into hidden places so they can worship with the Christians. What inconvenience did you face this morning in getting here? What inconvenience will hinder you tonight? What inconvenience will hinder you Wednesday? You see, at some point, I think the angels looking down from heaven look with admiration on those who spilled their blood for Christ. And they look at the church in the West and go, Really? Really? They cannot help but wonder, are there two different churches? Only one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We can't do anything else, folks, about any other church anywhere in the West. We can do something about this church. 
we just pledged again for the umpteenth time on the first Sunday of the month, we would not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And that's just touching the hem of the garment. There's living for Christ every day of the week. But how can we have that discussion? When the Lord's day for too many lasts about an hour, two hours. Not a thought given to the rest of it. When we gather and talk about praying for the persecuted church, but never give a thought about gathering to pray for the persecuted church every week. I want to challenge you this morning. But I think this is how we get ready for persecution. It's coming. It's coming. If anybody's taught you that you're going to escape it, that's a Western idea. It's not a biblical idea. The folks who will be taken out are those who suffered the most. And yet, as we've already said, the return of Jesus Christ is tied to the full number of the martyrs being executed, spilling their blood for the Lamb who spilled His blood for His people. If you're here today and you've not yet trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I will apologize to you that you live in a culture where the church in the West is so pitifully lukewarm. But I want you to know Jesus is not lukewarm. And I pray that God would save you by His grace and for His glory and raise you up to, to be an example to provoke those who've gotten comfortable in the Western culture. Provoke all of us to live for Christ like brothers and sisters in Christ around the world live for Christ. I pray that He will save you before this day is out. If you want to talk with us about that, we're available for that. Let's bow together. Pray. Again, we pray, dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we admire, as we're stunned and gripped and grieved over what we hear about happening around the world, help us to also be emboldened. Help us to be invigorated Help us to determine, as Hebrews 13.3 says, that we're to remember those who are in prison as if imprisoned with them, for they are the body of Christ. And Lord, we would say for us to be identified. They're, they're easily recognizable as the body of Christ when they will give their life for Jesus. Help us to be identified as the body of Christ. Help us to remember them in prayer as if they're with them so that we might be provoked to live lives of sacrifice for Jesus. For we ask this in His name and for His sake. Amen.